probably do better on answering questions okay. rather than sure, sure. So that uh, okay. All right, we're rolling. All right, this is an interview at the New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York. It is the 9th of March, 2007, approximately 10 a.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Um, what is your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Earl McKnight. My date of birth was 9-24-22, and I was born in Porter's, Porter Corners. Where is that now? That's uh, northern Saratoga County. Okay. Um, what was your educational background prior to entering the service? I had uh, high school and half a year of PG. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you remember where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor? I just came home from church and uh, I had snapped on the radio to get the news, and uh, I couldn't believe what we was hearing. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, later we heard the president give his little speech at that mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. Did you know where Pearl Harbor was? Only just through geography, mm -hmm. it was in the Hawaiian Islands. Okay. Um, did you enlist or were you drafted? No, I enlisted. Why did you decide to enlist? I didn't think I was much, I couldn't see myself punching around in the mud. Oh, okay. So that's why you chose the Navy? Yep. All right. Why did you decide to enlist in the first place, though? Uh, you just didn't want to be in the Army? No, that's true. Okay. All right. When did you go into service? Um, Why, uh, you haven't written on the paper, you went in in November of 42? Eleven, three, forty-two. Okay. Um, where did you go for your basic training? Forty-three, rather. Oh, you went in in forty-three? No, no, that is forty-two. Okay. Um, where did you go for your basic training? Samson. What was Samson like when you went there? That had just opened and uh, there was one graduating class from boot camp ahead of us. Mm -hmm. But they were just getting organized, you might say. Now, were there barracks there and so on when you went there? Yeah, mm -hmm. but uh, there was only one I don't know how many sections they had when they finally opened the thing up, but uh, there was one section open when we were there, and mm -hmm. I heard later that they was in the progress of other ones, mm -hmm. but how, how big it went up, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been out there since then? Uh, years and years ago, and I, it was probably... 20 years ago, something like that, I went by and I I can't tell you what they've got there now, mm -hmm. but uh, it's, uh, it don't look anything like it did when I was there. Didn't know what, what kind of equipment did you have there? Did you have the bo boats and whale boats and so on, or didn't have any? Later well, they did, I understand. Yes, right. But they didn't have that organized when I was there. Mm -hmm. so that I now, we had someone that was there when it first opened, and they had an outline of the boat on the ground, and they pretended they were paddling. Did you have to do that? Yeah, yeah, you went through all that. Mm -hmm. Okay. To acquaint yourself with what. How long were you at Samson? Nine weeks, I think. Mm -hmm. I think basic training was nine weeks. And then uh, when we went back, uh, we was in the middle of a school year. And uh, I was 
chosen to go to the next school in Memphis, Tennessee, and uh, I I hung around not or, uh, at least a month before we went. And I was uh, given the job of being a chaplain's runner, mm -hmm. or, and uh, that I enjoyed. Mm -hmm. And I think it was through talking with the chaplain that I got into Mexico in Memphis. But, uh, okay, now this is aviation mechanics. Yes. Is, now, how long were you there? How long were you in uh, Memphis? Uh, my weeks schooling in Memphis was 23 weeks, and then we stayed there an extra two weeks for radar training. From there we went to Hollywood, Florida for ground gunnery. That was four weeks, and then we went to uh, Fort Lauderdale for aerial gunnery, and that was four weeks. And whereabouts did you go from there? Uh, we had a... I don't know how to pull it. I, it's a delayed. It's a. a they give you a short leave, mm -hmm. but you take your leave on the way to your next, and that's when I went to join the squadron okay. in uh, Seattle. Mm -hmm. What was the squadron that he joined? VC uh, ten. Is that? Uh, <coughs> What kind of aircraft did they have? Uh, Grumman Avengers okay. and uh, the Wildcat was our fighter. I was trained as a turret gunner for the Avenger. Mm -hmm. I didn't score that good, so uh, when I when we went to sea, I was transferred out of the squadron and uh, was ship's company of the Gambier Bay. Okay. But she was a backup for your gunnery. When were you assigned to the Gambier Bay? I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Uh, see, we were assigned to the flight squadron, and then we trained. We met in Seattle, but we spent time in Astoria, Oregon, and then went down through California. Uh, they had uh, night flying out in the desert. There was one place that they had a resting gear so the pilots could land and catch the, the hook, the hook mm -hmm. and uh, stuff like that. And uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure of the date. Mm -hmm. Now, you were the first crew on the Gambier Bay? Yeah. So were you a plank holder? Are you familiar with that term? Mm, uh, I don't think that I am. Okay. Uh, what is your... Well, a, a, a plank holder is usually the first crew to go out with the ship. Okay, I was a plank holder. Okay. Um, so you picked up the Gambier Bay in California? Yeah. And you were... You left right from there? We went out on a couple of different shakedown cruises. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we 
had a couple of little things to get corrected and stuff like that, and then took off for Hawaii. And then uh, from that way, a lot of training and stuff like that on the way to Hawaii. Um, Somewhere along the line, we picked up brand new aircraft. Mm -hmm. How many aircraft were in your, your squadron? 30. And uh, I think that was split half and half between fighters and mm -hmm. TBMs. Okay. But it may not have been exactly mm -hmm. middle, but pretty close to it. Mm -hmm. Did you have any leave time in Hawaii at all, or? No. So you went right from Hawaii to uh, the war zone? We would get date time off, so mm -hmm. you could, but uh, I didn't have any leave time. Mm -hmm. Beautiful place. Where did you go from Hawaii? Uh, I can't remember the sequence of mm -hmm. it, but Tinian, Saipan, Guam, all of those, and I, I don't know what the mm -hmm. thing was. And, uh, at one time, I got a, down in New Guiana, I got on, shore, uh, on land, well, we needed something, and uh, I don't know why I was chosen to, with one of the brass to go pick up this part mm -hmm. with him, but at least I got my, put my feet on foreign soil in, the, in New Guiana. So you pl su supplied air support at Tinian and Guam and uh, Saipan? Our... Your carrier? Uh, our pilots did, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Um, did you ever have much mechanical problems with the planes or...? Uh, no great problems. No. No, just routine maintenance most of the time. Uh, when you got in the war zone then you had but bullet holes to mm -hmm. fix and stuff like that. But well, how did you repair the bullet holes? Uh, if it was in the fabric, that was cleaned off and a cloth patch plastered back over it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the metal, depending on how big it was, and if it was a small one and stuff like that, you might put a, a bolt through it just to plug the hole, mm -hmm. but uh, did you ever fly any missions at all, or you said you uh... when we were out there, the of course uh, I don't know if you know what the pay scale of it was at that time. If you were flu, you made 50% plus your base, that mm -hmm. was 50% of mm -hmm. your base pay. And uh, overseas, when you were out of the country, that was 10% more. And uh, just once did I fly out there, they would give the, the the crew men that were streamlined out of the squadron and made ship's company, they would take about one a month, or maybe two, depending where we were. Uh, as soon as daylight came up, you had two planes in the air at all time flying anti-sub patrol. Mm -hmm. and I went up on that, so I do flight skins for once when I was out there. But uh, that was just a lazy 
And uh, finally, knowing that I was trained for it, he says, do you want to fire the machine gun? Because that was a 50 caliber on a turret. Mm -hmm. And uh, you get to pop at the waves with it and stuff like that. But, Now, how did you spend your day on the ship? Uh, routine maintenance. Uh, most of the time when you got out there in the battle zone, you, uh, you goofed off during the day until the first flight came back. Maybe the plane happened to be up for an oil change. Uh, that you don't do it by miles, you do it by hours, flight time, mm -hmm. 30, 60, 90 hour checks, and uh, most of those are, they all have an oil change at that time, plus maybe change plugs or whatever, and the hours depend, determines what to be done to the plane at that time. Mm -hmm. The uh, All of ours were radial engines, which are air-cooled engines, of course, and uh, they're, uh, they're nothing like the, the jets of today. Mm -hmm. Are you spent most of your time on the hangar deck? Yeah. I spent all of my time on the hangar deck. Time, yeah. I didn't have a... I didn't have a place when you went to general quarters. All I had was a fire station, and that was right there on the hangar deck. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the lizard uh, at uh, Saipan, where your carrier had your squadron had a lot of kills or something. I thought I read. Of course, I learned more about my sea duty by reading different books, <laughs> not knowing what was going on, not right. than the, yeah. the planes took off and came back and got re ammoed and gassed up and this and that. Mm -hmm. So that uh, at Saipan, I later learned a, a friend of mine that was in the Marines, uh, each evening our fleet would pull back to sea away from the, the war zone there and uh, the Marines would bet among themselves how many of the tin cans and carriers would be back the next day. Mm -hmm. Did you have to rebuild the engines on the planes at all? Not aboard ship. Not aboard ship? No. No, and I think that was one of the reasons they gave us new planes before mm -hmm. we took over, or before we went over. Mm -hmm. After, after I came back, then I was in California, and I worked in the main R shop there, and we didn't work on the engines, but we did make engine changes. Okay. Well, I guess we might as well get to your action off Sumar. Samar. Samar, yes. What uh, What do you remember of that? Not that much about the battle, of course. You didn't even know what was going on. Mm -hmm. You're in a closed up place and a lot of bullets flying here and there. And mm -hmm. you 
Did you realize that your ship was under fire? Oh yes. Yeah. They they announced everything over the loudspeaker system. So that uh, yeah, they mistakenly thought when we first uh, sighted the enemy that it was some of our ships, mm -hmm. and later they found out that it was the enemy. Mm -hmm. You couldn't, could you see the ship being bracketed at all uh, when they were firing on you? No. You couldn't see that? No. Well, you must have felt it though. Oh, sure. Now, when was your hit, ship hit? I am not sure about time. Mm -hmm. But it was, uh, well, after 8 o'clock, the morning of the 25th of October. Mm -hmm. Time after nine o'clock, we abandoned ship. Mm -hmm. Now you were in fire control. Were there any fires on on the hangar deck that you were fighting? We had a we had an oxygen room that was near the aft elevator, and we could see there was a fire in that room. And there was a window there that the glass had been knocked out, so we poured water into that. How much good we did, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But that was my, my extent of my fighting the enemy. Mm -hmm. Now, when you were given the order to abandon ship, where did you go? Later, I'll show you where, where on the ship my fire station was. Mm -hmm. Well, why don't you hold that up and tell us, show us now? Now this is a, a uh, just inside of that. Mm -hmm. Was my fire station. Mm -hmm. That's where I was uh, during the battle. Mm -hmm. Now this is a carrier escort. Yes. So you, how many in the crew approximately? Uh, your ship? Your whole ship, yes. Roughly the, the ship <coughs> company plus the squadron is roughly a thousand men mm -hmm. in that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now when, when you were on fire and they announced the abandoned ship, what did you do? You were on the hangar deck, where did you go from there? Well, I did something that you're not supposed to do. We were listing pretty good. And uh, <coughs> I stepped off that sponson right there and started swimming. Did you wear a vest at all? Did you have a vest on? or? Uh, uh, <coughs> we had a belt. Belt, okay. And that uh, could be blown up by hand. Mm -hmm. yeah, you were supposed to have that with you at all times aboard ship. Mm -hmm. That and a full uniform. You didn't necessarily have to have it on, but you had to have a full uniform with you at mm -hmm. all times. Now you had, when did, did you inflate yours as soon as you hit the water? or? No. No, I swung like the Dickens to get away from the boat mm -hmm. because they would say that there would be an undertow mm -hmm. when you, and then of course going off the low side of it <coughs> to the high side like you're supposed to. Mm -hmm. And so I just swam by the ways before I inflated it. Did you see the ship go down? Yep. Could you describe that? When it rolled completely over before it went down, and there, I would say, it was as many holes below that water line as there was above. And reading about the battle years later, they were using armor person shells that went through and didn't explode or anything like that. So that. Uh, 
Your hull was so thin. Yeah. You know, you yeah. There was no <coughs> no armament, anything. Mm -hmm. at all. When you were in the water, did you have a uh, quite a few of the crew members around you? Yeah. How long were you in the water for? I'm not sure. As I said, it was sometime after nine o'clock on the morning of the 25th, mm -hmm. and sometime before daylight on the 27th, I was picked up. So you were in at least a day or over a day then? Yes. Were there many around you? The, the groups. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have any floating devices and stuff like that. They had a, uh, what am I saying? It would be a webbing type thing. And uh, the group that I was with, the wounded, they would let them get up on that, mm -hmm. get out of the water, and the rest of us just held on to the side of it, that type of thing. Were there sharks around you? Did you see I any? never saw a shark around me, but hearing stories later about different groups, sharks got a number of the men, and they told stories about, for instance, one uh, one guy sat with his feet hanging in the water, he was sitting on the edge, and a shark came up and bit him on the leg, and he reached down and gave him a rap with the back of his hand, and the shark let go and mm. flew away. And another time, a guy was jumping back in the water after he had had his rest period up on the, and as he turned and slid size back, back in the water, a shark grabbed him and just ripped his hind end right off him and he just lived for a few minutes before he bled to death. Mm. And as I say, that's all stories that I learned later because mm. I didn't see anything about anything in the sharks. Mm -hmm. but, uh, who picked you up eventually? Um, I think it was an LCI, Landing Craft, in Craft Infantry, mm -hmm. and that is, uh, they were designed for crossing the English Channel to take the, our Uh, soldiers and stuff across the English Channel when they invaded. But, uh, <clears throat> how many of your crew do you remember? Or did you ever hear how many survived? I understand that we lost roughly a tenth of our men, so a hundred or maybe a little bit more, which I figured was very, was very fortunate. Yeah, considering how much shell fire you were, yeah. I think two cruisers were firing on you, and yeah. hmm. um, after you were taken out of the water, what did they do with with you? When they took me out of the water, they asked me where my life belt was, and I told them I didn't have any. And I don't know what happened to it when I was in the water. Before dark of the second night, we could see land. And uh, I don't know if it was an officer with our group or somebody that knew his history or what and knew about the the currents of the ocean, but supposedly off Samar you get the Gulf Stream, mm -hmm. and uh, we were evidently in that, and that it, I guess that we were somewhere 
in the neighborhood of 70 miles off Samar when we sank, and the Gulf Stream must have, in the next 30 plus hours, brought us in so we could see land. And uh, he told everybody to get a hold of the side of the thing that was had our wounded on and paddled towards shore. And I don't know if I passed out from being exhausted, went to sleep, or what. But when I woke up, I didn't have my life belt on. I didn't. I was all alone, and I could see searchlights. I splashed, called out, not knowing mm -hmm. if it was our men or enemy or what. I say when they picked me up, I didn't have it. And they asked me where it was, and I didn't. And uh, he stuck a bottle of brandy in front of me. He says, "Have a sip," and I says, "How big a sip?" He says, "Have a good sip." And, uh, they stripped me, with ex except for my shorts, and I crawled in a bunk. That was afternoon before I woke up. Did you get sunburned much? or When I went over, I had a, a, a like a baseball cap. And I think that protected me a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, Survival training, they always tell you to <coughs> kick your shoes off. And I got sunburned on the instep of each foot. And how that happened, don't tell me because you're in the water all the time. Mm -hmm. But we all got uh, sunburned on our face. Most of us had an oil burn, like, and we figured that was from the the oil and fuel the, floating yeah, in the water. Yeah. Uh, all of us, the group that I was with, were s sick shortly after we got in the water, and uh, they there again. You're training told you to get on your back and stay there because if there was anything in the water that a shell went off or anything, your back can take more force than your stomach can. But uh, doctors later told us that uh, we were all sick from the force of Charges going off. Mm -hmm. Concussion. Yeah. And uh, most of us vomited enough that it was green colored. Mm -hmm. And he said we would di uh, our digestive juices that we were up chucking. Mm -hmm. but, uh, were you hospitalized at all? No. Okay, after you were picked up by the, you were picked up by an LCI, where did you go? We were transferred you? to an LST. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we went down to, uh, I can't tell you where we went to pick up the SS Lurleen. It's one of Matson's lines. And that was a pleasure boat. And they operated somewhere as other. I'm not sure if it was uh, just Hawaii to 
Australia or whether they came to the States or whatever, but that was a, that was made into a troop transport. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Did they give you any kind of leave to, to recover from from your experience? Not until after our new orders came. Mm -hmm. We came back into the we came back uh, uh, straight back from Australia and we came under the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco on the first day of December. And we hung around there until the 20th before we got our orders and then I was given 30 days delayed orders to go to Reading Field, which is near San Diego, California. And I was there for roughly 15 months, something like that, and when my points finally added it up enough so I could get out of the service. Mm -hmm. What were your duties like in San Diego? Uh, <clears throat> that was just uh, after I came back. Mm -hmm. uh, that was just uh, regular mech duties. Mm -hmm. uh, we would make engine changes, uh, wing changes, whatever the plane needed. Mm -hmm. uh, did you go up on any maintenance flights or no. test flights? No. Did you get to see any uh, USO shows or no? I did anything like that. No. Now, where were you discharged? Uh, when I was in California. There. A friend of mine from Texas, when he came back from leave, he rode his motorcycle back, and he got uh, he got transferred again, and he wanted to sell the motorcycle, so I bought it, and I had that there. Well, probably close to a year before my point system let me, and because I I wanted to ride that home, I took my discharge in California. What kind of motorcycle was it? I knew it. <laughs> Thirty-eight sixty-one overhead Harley. Oh days. boy! <laughs> I was a Harley man. <laughs> How long did it, take you, did it take you to get home on that? Well, that's another story. <laughs> I checked it all over before I left. And uh, the first day I caught up with a, a guy that had been in the Army. And he had a little uh, 45. And uh, his, uh, I like to ride 60 miles an hour. but. Mm -hmm. His would heat up and yeah. it would choke down, so we'd have to slow down. So he would, uh, he'd like to stop about 3 30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, find a place to stay. Uh, he wanted an early supper and then he wanted to drink beer until bedtime. He didn't want to get up going in the morning. And uh, so I stayed with him, I don't know, three or four days. And after that, I told him, I says, you can putter along if you want to. He lived in New Jersey, just across the uh, river from New York City. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <clears throat> so I left him. But uh, I got as far as Alabama, 
and uh, my chain drive chain starts slipping on a rear wheel mm -hmm. and uh, I had checked everything over before I left out there but your front sprocket on the back chain is all enclosed behind a, the front gear mm -hmm. case and all you can see is just uh, the nips of the sprocket yep. and that had worn so so I jacked the wheel back a little bit to tighten the chain and that would get you another 20, 50 miles maybe and it finally got so that I, I couldn't uh, get it any tighter and keep it uh, so uh, I set it on the train I jumped on the bus and came on home. You still have that bike? No. And I suppose if I did, they'd give you a brand new Harley. Oh driver. God! No, I. After I married, when our first son was born, I sold it mm -hmm. before something happened. Now, after you were discharged, did you make use of the GI Bill at all? No, I didn't. I. Uh, sort of kicked myself that I didn't, uh, of course, uh, Schenectady and Albany didn't have that great a airport at that time, and uh, I uh, went to work for an international paper in the repair department, spent 36 years there repairing parts of the mill. A lot of the work when I first went there was new installations. They were changing from uh, uh, newsprint mill to a coated paper mill. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that, uh, that was pretty much my work until the last five years or something like that. Did you ever do, use the 5220 Club? No. Join any veterans organizations? No. I didn't have any time. IP took up all my time. <laughs> <laughs> do you ever stay in contact with anyone that was in service with you? I did with a couple of the guys that I had met in boot camp. Uh, one lived in Hudson, one in Utica, and they're gone now, so mm -hmm. that, uh, there's no one that I keep tabs with. How do you think your time and your experiences that you had uh, in the service had an effect on your life? I got to see some country and there were parts of the world I'd never seen. Mm -hmm. I don't know how it really affected my life in any way. That uh, never shot at the enemy. Never saw the enemy, only for the fact that after we went over the side they come sailing by and we was wondering if they would strafe us in the water, which they did a lot of different battles that I read about mm -hmm. and uh, they didn't do that with us. So. Uh, did you ever, uh, I know at the time you didn't realize it, but after you read and so on, what do you think of Halsey's decision to leave your Taffy 3 basically alone? Have you ever thought about that? Yeah. But, uh, <coughs> not knowing any more about it at the time that I did. And even now, we all 
that a thousand on hindsight. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It, uh, it, uh, it's just decisions that uh, Now, um, now you said was your carrier when it went down was it camouflaged? Yeah, painted camouflage. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that it's different than the picture you showed us then. Uh, I can't tell you the. I can't tell you the colors. Now, when you got on board, was it painted that way, camouflaged, or was that done later on? That I don't remember. Okay. Now you have some photographs of yourself. First of all, why don't you show us your, your class photographs when you were in mechanic school? These were all this this one was taken in Memphis? Yeah. Now where are you in that photograph? Right there. Okay. Okay. Got it. This is BC-10 squadron personnel before we went to board ship. Those just the mechanics, or are those that that's the that's all of the uh, the entire squadron? Yeah, that wasn't pilots. Oh, okay, just but uh, that was uh, mechanics and everything else that was with the squadron. I think that was me peeking out behind the red shot. Okay, you got your thumb over the... Okay. okay. Yeah, that does look like you. Okay. All right. When, uh, before we went aboard ship, I was a plane captain. And uh, I had to gas the plane and make sure the tires was blowed up and stuff like that. And 72 was my plane, which is the number that's on this plane. And uh, So you had a team assigned to each plane or? Yeah. Oh, okay. So you worked on the same plane all the time. Yeah. What kind of plane was it that you worked in? That was a fighter. A Wildcat? That was me right there. Okay. Got it. All right. So uh, a plane captain then had to check it so before it left on its flight. Okay. When I went aboard ship, then mm -hmm. I went worked in the, on a hangar deck so that I was no longer a plane captain. Oh, okay. That was another picture. This is another picture of the 
engineering force. I'm right in the middle of it. Okay. <coughs> this is uh, the uh, this is the group that was uh, in uh, I think this was taken to Rain Field when I went back to California after. And uh, I again don't remember the name of any of them. Okay. Um, so this would have been taken after the war was over? Yeah. Okay. Two. Okay. Now you have the individual photographs. Yeah, some there. That's when I was in Hollywood, Florida. Before we did our gunnery school. Okay. So when was that one taken? That was before we went overseas, after we joined the squadron. That was taken in Astoria, Oregon. Okay. And, all right. And, and what was your uh, rank when you got out? AMM1C, first class. Okay. That's three stripes. That was aviation machinist mechanic. Mechanic, okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your interview. That. Uh, I don't know if you're interested in something like that. I I can zoom right in on it. Oh, okay. Was that's that when, when you crossed the equator? That's when I became a shell bank. Mm -hmm. Okay. What was that like? Got it. <laughs> All fun and marbles. <laughs> that was when I got out of the service. Okay, great. You had to, had to carry that with you. Okay, well thank you very much. I don't know. The I don't know what happened to my medals and all that kind of stuff that we were supposed to wear, but somewhere along the line, in, in my discharge papers, I was allowed to wear the Victory Medal in World War II, Asiatic Pacific Area with three stars, American Area Philippines Liberation, one star, Air Crew Insignia, that was the thing that was on my Mm -hmm. Forearm on the one picture. Uh, good conduct medal, presidential unit citation, task force 7743, ribbon bar with the bronze star. I, I don't know what happened to all of my ribbons over the years. They got thrown away or. You the medals themselves? Uh, no medals. No, oh, no, okay. just the ribbons mm -hmm. that we were about to wear. Okay. It, they was real uppy about everybody wearing all the ribbons they were supposed to. Well, you were supposed to show that you've been overseas. That was strictly for the girls' benefit, they said. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, thank you very much.